turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 1. We're going to return to our study in Psalm chapter 119 next week. Uh, but this week, we had a few extra things going on, many of you know, and we're actually able to be a part of the uh, conference that we had on Friday. Just had a wonderful time, and a lot of folks showed up, a lot of wonderful speakers. Um, it was very important for us, and we heard this kind of feedback from a lot of church folks and leaders and pastors that it was incredibly important to spend time thinking and talking about the matter of human sexuality from a Christian worldview. So part of what I am going to do this morning is I'm going to bore you to death with some of what I talked about. No, hopefully I won't bore you to death. I'm going to take a little bit of what I talked about on Friday, and we're going to root it and ground it in Scripture, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about God's design for the human person and for marriage and for family. So as you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, you're also going to want to keep your finger... A little bit later on, we're going to move into the New Testament, into Titus chapter 2. So those are going to be our passages of Scripture for this morning. Now, coming off of our conference and the topic being human sexuality, it is, it is very easy to get wrapped up in seeing how our culture makes mistakes with marriage and with family and with the matter of human sexuality. Uh, several of our speakers talked about some of what was what is actually going on inside of our culture, some of the cultural and political and legal and academic pressures and movements that are going on around us that I think many of us are aware of just simply because we're aware of what's in the air politically and so forth. It's very easy to see how things begin to go wrong with the matters of marriage and family and human sexuality. Dysfunction is easy. Sliding downhill is easy. The importance for the follower of Jesus Christ, though, is maintaining and learning what it means to live out the function instead of the dysfunction, what it means to live in God's light. And so we see that in all kinds of ways, our our culture is choosing these ways of life that are destructive. It's so easy for us in our sin and in our brokenness We want to make decisions that we think are our own. I don't want to allow others to tell me what to do with my decisions or what to do with my body. And we think when we make those kinds of decisions, they are our own when in fact they are not our own. They've been imposed upon us by so many others. We want to make decisions that we think make us free from the bonds of some ancient religion and puritanical morality or some old way of thinking, but in fact, all of those ways are freedom of free, that we think of freedom and liberty are in fact nothing but death and destruction. And what we see when we pay attention to God's design for marriage and family and human sexuality is that God's purpose and design is a moral advance for everyone who is involved. Guys, absolutely everywhere, God's design is lived out. It is a moral advance. It is good for men and women and children. And it turns out that it's good for the rest of society as well. In other words, we do better as people and as families when we follow God's design and we learn how as a church to lovingly and wisely promote God's design. So here's sort of the uh, three things I want to talk about this morning through our passages of Scripture. First of all, I want to talk about that design, how it is actually built, and I mean literally built, into every single one of us. And then I'm going to want to talk about the image of God, what it means to be made in the image of God. And, And friends, that is more and more to me one of the most beautiful and profound doctrines that there are in Scripture. Every human being is precious and of inestimable worth in God's sight, made in the image of their Creator, God. So I want to talk about a little bit at least what it means to be made in the image of God. And then through the passages that we're going to read, I want to talk about families and marriage and how our dysfunction can be turned into the proper Function And through the passage that we're going to read, we're going to get to talk about the importance of fathers and of men as well this morning. The power of fathers and families, 
in the power of godly men and spiritual fathers inside of spiritual families, the local church of Jesus Christ. So our first passage of Scripture comes from Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Let's read this. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What we read here in this passage, these few verses in Genesis chapter 1, it's the last day of the six days of creation. This is the story of Genesis chapter 1. On the first day, on the second day, on the third day, and we get this order of creation. And all throughout, these pieces of creation begin with a phrase of something like, let there be, and let there be, and suddenly there is. It's this incredible passage of Scripture. But when we get to this passage, it's the sixth day. On the seventh day, God rests. So the sixth day is God's final day of creation. This is the very last thing that God creates in all of creation. And it's an absolutely unique day. Now, every day is incredible to walk through and watch how God orders things and puts them together and, and builds them piece by piece. But when we get here, the story actually changes a little bit. It changes in substance and it becomes unique at this moment of creation. You see, on this moment, on the sixth day of creation, the last thing God does, it begins with this conversation. And God says, let us make men in our image after our likeness. And that language is instructive for us. This isn't just a lecture that God gives to who knows who, but this is actually a conversation that God has. Let us have. It's our first hint at the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is this one in essence, but is God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, this relational reality in the being of God Himself. And then we already know, if we've been reading carefully through Genesis 1, that this part of creation is going to be different in its very nature from everything else. But guys, I find this astonishing. When we sit and we think about all the things that God created, from the expanse of the universe to the beauty and the, the complexity of the biology of creation here on planet Earth, it's amazing that God did not put His image and likeness in galaxies. He didn't put His image and likeness in whales. He put His image and likeness in you and me. These gigantic, astounding, awe-inspiring things are beautiful and made by the hand of God, but there is only one creature in all of creation that bears the image of God. And there's a bunch of them sitting in this room. Isn't that astounding? So scripture says He created man or humanity. And then in verse 27, in male and female, He created them. In verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over everything that is in the earth. That word dominion in the English is a little bit unfortunate for us the way that we think of and use that word. It doesn't mean necessarily to lord ourselves over creation as if we are robber barons, but it's a little bit more like gardening and caretaking. Let them be stewards over the earth. We're gardeners over creation and over the rest of the animal kingdom. But God tells this male and female, or at least it is part of His original design for male and female made in the image of God that they would be fruitful and that they would multiply. You see, God's design for these two individuals, these biologically distinct and interactive individuals, male and female, is to fill the earth 
with all kinds of others, little males and females. That's their job. So far, so good, right? God's design from the very beginning is for, for them to be united body and soul in marriage and as a family. And God creates them in such a way that when male and female are together in this kind of union, there's at least that potential for all kinds of little human beings to start showing up. There's this fascinating moment at the end of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 1 is the, is the story of the six days of creation. Genesis chapter 2 digs in a little bit more into creation from a different perspective, deals very specifically with Adam and then with Eve. And then right at the end of Genesis 2, in verse 24, we get this amazing little verse of Scripture. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, if you're familiar with Scripture and you're familiar with the Gospels, you know that Jesus speaks of this, and Scripture refers to this kind of moment. But here's what's fascinating about this. Before there are mothers and fathers, before there are grandmothers and grandfathers, before there are children, it is instituted in God's design that this kind of union of marriage is going to happen between male and female. Isn't that interesting? Before we have these giant ladders of family structures, God begins the institution that is at the very core of the human experience, and it is the human family Mom and dad, and then potentially the coming of kids. You see, marriage and the family are literally God's design for men, women, and children. It's a design that is actually built into us biologically. It's built into us psychologically. And it's good for our flourishing. It's been very popular through the years in different circles to downplay or mock and make fun of this idea of sometimes what's called the nuclear family, a mom and dad and 2.6 kids. Well, that's just a social construction. There are other cultures that just do it so vastly differently. This is just the way that we do it. Well, friends, that's false. It's not a social construction. It's not something we made up. It's actually a brute fact of nature. It's exactly how God designed it that it would be this way, and that that would be good for all of us. So we've talked about this before um, here on Sunday mornings, but I want to talk about it in this context as well. I want to talk about the created pattern that God gives for marriage and for family. And we're using four words. I used to use three, but because of some of the trends that are in culture right now, it's important that we use four. Here are the four words that I believe describes the biblical definition of marriage and family. Heterosexual, monogamous, lifelong, binary, two. Okay? Heterosexual, monogamous, lifelong, and binary. And I believe these four words help create these guardrails, if you will, around the biblical definition of what God intends marriage and family to look like. Now, I know... There are a lot of people who disagree with that point of view. And I've read a lot of those disagreements. I've read some of those books and those articles and been in those discussions about, well, that's not really what the Bible teaches. We've moved well beyond that. We've learned X, Y, and Z, and it teaches us that Scripture doesn't actually say any of that. Friends, I have not run across a single argument that successfully says this is not the biblical point of view. This is clearly the truth about what God teaches about marriage and family, and what even our very natures, our biology and psychology teaches us is best about marriage. But here's what happens in a culture that wants to push against that and change that. When we begin to remove any one of these four guardrails, it's not just that we've slightly changed by marriage by just moving one of them, but we maintain the other three. That doesn't happen. The moment you move, remove one of those guardrails, you've removed all of them. There is no in principle reason to maintain any kind of boundaries on marriage. So we're accustomed to this now in our culture. The notion of the, the gender issue itself, heterosexuality, well, that's in a lot of circles, that's just gone. We can no longer call that marriage. 
Years ago, it was believed that, well, we can just simply redefine marriage by saying, if there's just a loving and committed relationship between two people, then we're going to be able to call that marriage. Well, I'm here to tell you that number two is gone. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are serious people out there arguing that why on earth would we limit it to two? What if three or four or five people could be in a loving, committed relationship? And I love this word. We talk about married couples in... uh, New York Times op-eds in the literature and so forth, they're beginning to talk about thruples, not just couples. Everyone say thruples. It's, it's a fun word to say, thruples. See, the number, the binary issue is gone, and on and on it goes. There are people who are stretching the age of consent even, right, in what we can consider marriage. Friends, every one of those boundaries goes away as soon as you remove one of them. And we're watching exactly that happen inside of our culture. But here we are as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ, realizing that when we hold to the biblical definition of marriage, it actually holds on to us. When we keep it, it keeps us well. And both the Old and the New Testaments uphold this view, clearly uphold this view, And as the Old and New Testaments talk about and deal with it, with God's people, it is always a moral advance. In the Old Testament, sometimes that gets a little bit complicated and funny for us because we read some of these Old Testament laws on marriage and family and human sexuality and they seem foreign to us and they seem a little bit odd. But here's how we understand the Old Testament in this way. The Old Testament has given us very clearly, and we've read it, the design. And then in our sin, we begin to do all kinds of crazy and ridiculous things with that design, and we begin to break it to pieces. So all of these Old Testament laws fit in this tension-filled environment between what God intends and what we have decided to do anyway. And what God's laws do is they're constantly bringing the people of God back to His design, even though the cultures around them continue to slide further and further away. And when you actually spend time with the Old Testament laws, as odd as they seem to us sometimes, the Old Testament provides this unique bubble of provision and protection for women and children in a culture and in surrounding cultures where that rarely existed. So the Old Testament will often give legal rights to a woman who has been mistreated in marriage. Now to us, that seems utterly normal. To them, that was utterly novel. It didn't happen in the cultures around them, but the Old Testament does so. The Old Testament protects children who are the unloved children of the second or third polygamous wife and will not receive provision from dad when dad is gone. The Old Testament protects them. You see, in our sin, we do ridiculous things, but God provides protection and provision even inside of our sin. So God, even in the Old Testament, is pulling people back to His good plan. They kept messing it up, and He kept bringing them back to what He knew was actually good for them. And these laws in the Old Testament, they also create limits on men in a world where, where, where limits were rarely imposed upon them. You see, in that world, that culture, and even the New Testament culture we'll talk about in just a second, the, the sexual rights that were given to men were enormously broad. There were very few cultural and legal restrictions upon men and what they could do to anybody they wanted to. And the world that women and children lived in legally and culturally was very, very narrow. And so when God is rebuilding His laws and His will for His people, what He is doing for men is He is pulling them back into this relationship that is a committed, sacrificial, loving, and dedicated relationship to their wives and to their children. See, God is changing what culture has messed up and bringing it back to His design. We see it in the New Testament, maybe sometimes more clearly than in the Old because it's maybe easier for us to absorb. But the New Testament and the early church infuses marriage and human sexuality with moral meaning and divine meaning. It actually makes these things sacred. 
And that's important because in the New Testament and in the lives of Christians, disciples, these things are sacred instead of the animalistic and pragmatic sexual world that the early church lived in. The Roman view of human sexuality may not at all be what you imagine unless you've done a little bit of reading on this subject. We have the same sort of situation where what is permissible for a man is broad and can include just about anybody. What is permissible and legal for women and children is enormously narrow. And along come these crazy Christians. Begin to realize, well, God's design is different. God's design is good. So inside of a world that views marriage and human sexuality in a very promiscuous and debauched way, we're going to do things differently. We're going to live in our marriages differently. We're going to treat our wives and husbands differently according to the ethic given to us by God, spoken about in Jesus Christ, taught to us by the Apostle Paul. We're going to live differently. And these things now are infused with divine meaning. Paul at one point in Ephesians chapter 5 when he's talking about husbands and wives and men and women, at one point his bottom line is essentially this. Now what I'm talking about is a mystery. I'm talking about Christ and His church. See, these things become sacred for the follower of Jesus Christ. And here's what happens as a matter of history for the early church, the book of Acts and the next 100 or so, 200, 300 years after that. The Christian point of view on these things that's taught in the New Testament and lived out in the early church was just radically different than the world around it. But because of its moral advantages, it actually raised the lives of those who followed the standard. And eventually, the Christian view actually outlived the Roman Empire and its debauchery. We are inheritors of of the lives that the early Christians lived. Here's one of the reasons why I find that so incredibly important. I think, this is me personally, I believe that the church today finds itself in a very similar situation. The culture around us is choosing the Roman way. It's choosing the broad way. It's choosing this liberality when we talk about marriage and family and human sexuality. And so now there is this, and it might be for you and me in our culture, an utterly unique opportunity to do exactly what our Christian forebearers did 1,700 years ago. We live out God's design. We live out God's good way of doing things. And because it is true and because it is good and because it raises the lives of those who live it, the faithful church of Jesus Christ will outlive this second wave of Roman debauchery. I promise you. This is what the faithful church of Jesus Christ will do. Now I want to talk for a minute about something else that was mentioned in that Genesis passage. In verse 26 it says, And the God said, Let us make man in our image. And after our likeness, like us. And then that beautiful verse in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. All of us made in the image of God. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, if you have the next 12 hours free, we can actually talk that one through. (laughs) It's a big answer. It's a beautiful answer to deal with what that means. But in this context, one of the things that it means is that we as creatures who are this combination of body and soul are made in the image of God. That means physically, this thing is important to us as creatures made by God. Sometimes the phrase that is used to describe that by Christian theologians is that we are ensouled bodies. We are not this binary, bizarre thing, but we are this magnificent and unique combination of soul and body, and all of it has meaning. Now, here's one of the reasons why that is so important. Because one of the ways this goes wrong, and it goes wrong in our culture this way a lot, is that we can begin to believe that what's on the inside is all that matters. What I desire, what I feel, is all that matters morally. What's going on in my mind or my soul, whatever you want to call it, 
is the only thing that matters morally, and this body is just nothing but a temporary flesh bag. And I can do whatever I want to with it and just move on with my life as long as I follow my desires, my feelings, whatever my mind or my soul tells me. For those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, this heresy has been around for 2,000 years. It's called the Gnostic heresy. We deny the usefulness of our bodies, the meaning of our bodies, and all that matters is what happens on the inside. There is another error that happens in our culture, and it's very materialistic. It believes that we as human beings are nothing more than input-output machines. There's nothing unique or free will about us. You are what some people call a flesh computer. So just like a computer, you input data, it does its calculations, it outputs data, it's very predictable in a lot of ways, that's all you are. Both of those are radical mistakes. We are, in fact, this unique combination and unity of soul and body. You add on top of this, this amazing moment that happens on the first Christmas morning when Jesus is born into flesh to Mary. He is incarnated. The word incarnated just means to be put into a body. So God, who is perfect spirit, comes and joins us in a body like this one that emphasizes the role that our bodies play in our relationship with God and with each other. All of these things infuse our physical bodies with divine meaning. So our bodies and the way in which they were made are a critical part of how we live and how we make moral decisions. There are a lot of forces in our culture right now that believe that we can make our bodies into anything we want. And if you follow that rabbit trail, it's going to make you sick quick. The hormonal therapy, the surgical therapy, and on and on the story goes. For some reason, there are those in our culture who have a certain degree of cultural power who believe that we can remake your body into anything that you want. But the biblical design, the truth about who we are, doesn't let us make those kinds of decisions about our bodies and our beings. In a twist of what is irony for a lot of people, the Christian ethic is actually deeply pro-body. The Christian ethic takes our creation as a signal of God's purpose for us. So the unity of husband and wife is revealed to us in Scripture, and it is revealed to us in our bodies, in our biology. And that context is best for men and women and for children. Moms and dads aren't interchangeable with each other for each other or for children. So all of Scripture emphasizes the unique power of family and even of human sexuality when it is rightly lived. And Scripture emphasizes how important this is for the health of society and how important it is for a church to teach when it starts to go wrong. And that's where I want to go now is to the book of Titus In Titus chapter 2, so we move from the story in Genesis that is the design, the way God built us. And when we begin to read Titus chapter 2, we begin to read the correction. Things have gone wrong. We actually learn a lot about how things have gone wrong. And we listen to Paul and this young pastor talk about how things need to be put right. So, Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, let's read a little bit of the story here. Paul is writing to Titus, a young pastor, and says this, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the Word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects, 
to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may put, be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Paul's writing to a young pastor in a very complicated situation. Titus is the pastor of the church on the island of Crete. Now remember, when these kinds of things are written in the New Testament, everyone's a brand new Christian. No one's a generational Christian. Everyone's a brand new Christian. And on the island of Crete, it turns out that this culture's very interesting to begin with. Let's read what Paul says about those who live on the island of Crete in Titus chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. One of the Cretans. Now, if you called someone a Cretan today, what are you doing? You're insulting them. Why is that the case? Well, because of what Paul reveals to us here. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Paul says, it's absolutely true. This is what the church is made up of. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. He's talking about elders in the church here. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Paul learns that the Christians there in Crete are more like the Cretan culture than they are like Jesus Christ. So the things that Paul lists that we read in Titus chapter 2, these are not random things that Paul just has this list of, well, and this and this and all, you know, I'm thinking about it, let's make sure we add this. He's heard that these are actual problems in the church, and so he says, here's how we correct them, right? So he gives Titus all of this advice about how to pastor and lead these people into a lifestyle that honors Christ and is good for them. It turns out, if you read Titus carefully, we learn that the Cretans and the Cretan Christians had been drunkards and abusers. That's not good. We learn that many of them were serial thieves. It's not good. We learn that a lot of them were actually serial adulterers and very loose with their sexuality. It's not good. They've been neglectful of their children in their home. Again, not good. And as Christians, they tend to slide right back into that lifestyle, and that has to be corrected. So the Apostle Paul begins in chapter 2, verse 1, by telling the pastor, teach what accords with sound doctrine. You see, for the health of the Christians and for their discipleship, it is absolutely critical that their pastor and their church stick to what we know is true, what has already been taught and revealed to us in God's design and in Scripture. And so what this means, guys, is that the pastor and the church, they cannot, they do not become slaves to whatever is popular in our culture, whatever cultural winds are blowing. You see, our job as Christians is to stick to what is sound doctrine. That means we can't, just because there are certain cultural pressures upon us, we can't leave the design that God has given us. We must continue to teach it, and we must continue to live it out. So as a result, guys, we remain rooted in the things of Christ. As you read through, as we read through chapter 2, those first eight verses, you might have noticed the theme of self-control. This is a word that in your Bible, you highlight things, you might want to highlight and just see how often that phrase, self-control, shows up in a very short book. Why do you think? <laughs> he has to say self-control over and over again to a culture that was sexually licentious. He says older men should be self-controlled. Older women should be reverent, and they should teach younger women to be self-controlled. Young men should be self-controlled. And all of this is about the maturity of the disciple of Jesus Christ. All of this involves the story of marriage and human sexuality, how husbands and wives should treat each other and their children. And so much of it speaks to sexual purity. I can imagine the young pastor Titus, he receives this letter and he's shaking his head and he goes, I know it, I've got to do something about this. So his next sermon title is, Self-control for everybody. <laughs> That's what we're going to talk about, guys, for weeks until we get this straight. 
And then as Paul continues in Titus, he says something that I am personally, I just I enjoy the fact that this phrase is in the book of Titus. Paul says this is good for everyone. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 8. The saying is trustworthy. All these things he's been talking about, they're trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for everybody. Not just you, not just your kids, but for everybody. It's going to be good for your Cretan culture as well to watch you live a different kind of life. Now, I want to end on a couple of these thoughts because it is Father's Day. I want to pay special attention to how that comes out in the book of Titus with the things that Paul has to say about the unique power of men and, fam- uh, men and fathers in their families and in their churches. Folks, men matter. Godly men matter. Our culture demeans the role and the value of men and fathers for all kinds of crazy reasons. But we as followers of Jesus Christ, we recognize that men matter. And godly men make a difference. And as we read through these passages, we're going to see that they matter inside of their homes. Homes need godly men in them. Godly men matter in the workplace. The business world needs men and it needs women of integrity and of wisdom. And godly men matter to the life of the local church. The local church needs spiritual fathers. Not every family has a father in the home. But this is one of those things that the local body of Christ can help with And that is providing spiritual fathers. It's never a full replacement for a biological or a stepfather. It's not a full replacement, but it is something that the church can provide when it is healthy and when it is strong. We've read those first few verses in chapter 2. I want to read Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. He's speaking of the qualification for elders. but We think of this this morning in terms of the power of men and fathers. Verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, Titus, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. We need leaders, and here's what I want them to look like. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Obviously, this is, how, this is who some of them were. But hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So we put these two passages of Scripture together. I want to think about godly men in four different contexts, I think talked about by Paul and Titus here. First of all is men and their wives. Paul tells us that young men ought to be self-controlled and that married men need to honor their relationships with their wives. They weren't in the Cretan culture but they're becoming Christians and followers of Jesus Christ. So they're intended to change these lifestyles and these different values apply to them. This is one of the unique roles, one of the powerful roles that a father can play. Little boys have a lot of energy. They can get directed in all kinds of ways and they don't know quite what to do with all of it through all of the stages of life. But boys can learn self-control by watching their fathers deal with complicated situations in a self-controlled fashion. Someone once said that men don't know what boys don't learn. Isn't that interesting? So there's this unique role for a father preparing men for marriage. And we've learned that men and women are made for each other, body and soul. And that this union is this mysterious, divine reflection of Christ in His church. And so Paul tells Timothy to tell his church leaders and the young men in his church that men who are emotionally and physically faithful to their wives stick out in a world where that kind of faithfulness is often looked down upon. You're going to be different. 
You're just going to be different as you follow Jesus Christ. Men and their wives. Men and their children is another context here. Paul actually expects these men to be present fathers who help lead their children to Christ. It's important that we understand that fathers cannot leave parenting up to mothers. I've got other stuff to do. You go ahead and do that. Because if a father steps back from that role, all kinds of other things are ready to step into that role. And if you want Facebook raising your children, then go ahead and step back, (laughs) right? Paul wants these men to be present so that their children will grow up to be and be these kinds of individuals that he describes. Fathers and dads have this powerful role to play. And so fathers have this opportunity to use this word to imprint their faith upon their children as much as possible. So godly men do this inside of their homes, and they do it, friends, as spiritual fathers in their churches. The church in the home, I find this beautiful at a moment like this, the church in the home can actually reinforce one another. I know it is not a perfect system, and I know children grow up and they make decisions that break the hearts of parents. I know that. Individuals make decisions as they grow up and they do different things, but this is a system that is intended to reinforce one another. What happens inside of the home spiritually, and then what happens inside of the church spiritually as well. When we gather We show up as spiritual mothers and fathers and spiritual brothers and sisters and spiritual moms and dads and grandparents. It's one of the reasons that we dedicate children in this church the way that we do. It's not just we're asking these parents to make sure that they raise these children to know and love Jesus Christ, but I turn to you and I ask you, are you ready to help this family so that this child can grow up to get to know Jesus Christ? This is one of our roles. Men and their wives and men and their children, men and their work, this shows up in this passage. We don't have time to dig through this, but Paul tells us quite clearly, these kinds of godly men, they're, and this is the language he uses, they're above reproach, they're good stewards, they're not greedy for grain, they're upright, and they are disciplined. Men in their work are important. There are ways to do our work that honor God. You see, these godly men find those kinds of ways, and that's how they go to work. Men and their wives and their children and men and their work, and then men and their God. Paul expects these kinds of men are familiar with the things of God. He says, I want them to be able to discern true from false doctrine." I want them to be able to get to the point where they're actually able to teach true from false doctrine. This is part of the powerful role that godly men play inside of their homes and inside of the church. What a gift to a family. What a gift to a church. When there are these kinds of men who love and get to know their God. When our families know that men value the things of God. And even when we men are able to teach others the things of God. And then I think it's important to read where Paul takes us after what we just read. Because all of this fits into the larger plan of Christ's work in all of us. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Four. So I want your people living this way, Titus. Because the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. We behave this way. We live this way. Different from the rest of the world in so many ways because we are waiting for the blessed hope of the appearance of the glory of our God, our Lord Jesus. 
Christ. If you want to put it like this, here's part of the image. That when Jesus, we live this way so that when Jesus actually does show up, He has already been present in our homes. He has already been welcome in our lives, in our families, and we prepare ourselves for His return. Let's pray.